If William Shakespeare were writing about financial markets today, he might write a variation on his prose from Macbeth. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. Bubbles are littered throughout financial history, from the housing bubble that led to the current economic malaise to the dot-com bubble in 2000, even as far back as Dutch tulip mania in the 1630s. So how do market bubbles form, and how can you avoid getting caught up in them? Colin Kammerer, professor of behavioral finance and economics at the California Institute of Technology, did a study on the psychology behind bubble formation in financial markets. He also recently won a MacArthur Genius Award for his innovative studies on financial behavior. And he joins me now. Professor Kammerer, thanks so much for coming on the program. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. This is such an interesting study. I mean, to get right to it, how do bubbles form? So uh, let me say a little about what we did, and um, I'll talk about what's going on in the brain, which was the, what's part of what's novel and very challenging about what we did. So what we do is to create artificial assets. And the pure value of the asset is if people hold it after a period of trading, we pay them a money dividend. So the, the value of the assets is the discounted dividend value. It's the flow of the dividends. And then the, after 50 periods of trading, the assets um, are terminated. So we know what the correct price is. And the subjects in the experiment have a pretty good idea. What we do is have the subjects either actually trade among themselves, so they create whatever price they want. Uh, and in other cases, we, watch, we have them watch a replay of a market other subjects engaged in, and they can kind of you know watch the market and bet bet the price will go up or go down. So they're trying to guess, you know, what do these other people do and what's happening. And you found that when a bubble is forming, traders have a tendency to look at what other traders or other people are doing around them, and that's what helps feed that bubble, right? Correct. So uh, the the main finding in a paper published in Neuron a few weeks ago is that a region of the brain called the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, which is a couple inches above the, between your eyebrows. Dorsal means the top of the brain, like a dorsal fin of a shark. Medial is in the middle. And we found this is an area that's known to be involved in what's called theory of mind or mentalizing. Uh, that means to be the, the, the probably unique to humans capacity to imagine you know, what another organism, probably a person, wants or believes or will do in the future. You know, do they like me? Uh, are they, uh, they going to get angry? Are they going to keep trading at this bubble price for a long time? And so it turns out that the subjects who are most likely to participate in the bubbles have more activity in this region. And when the bubbles are going on, there's a stronger link between that area, which is here, and an area that's a little bit below called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is a very general region that kind of encodes value of all types. So how do you so, avoid getting caught up in a bubble? I mean, do you basically just think for yourself and try to tune out the noise? Yeah, so basically one, one, one thought is that, you know, people who are more unplugged from you know, what's going on in the market may be more dispassionate and not as caught up in the mentalizing. So you might want to have your office in, say, Omaha, Nebraska, where Warren Buffett is, versus uh, New York City or um, uh, Shanghai or any place else where there's a tremendous amount of kind of social hubbub around uh, the bubbles. Is this study a blow to the theory that there is wisdom in crowds? Uh, well, it's certain, I think it, it shows the opposite side of the coin. So. The wisdom in crowds effects are, are, pretty, are pretty remarkable and go back a long time. The, the earliest one actually was Francis Galton, who has sort of invented some early ideas in statistics. And he asked a group of people at a, a fair, you know, how much a cow weighed. And most people said, I have no idea, but he kind of pressed them to collect answers. And then he took the average of a small number of answers, and the average was really, really close, within a couple of percent. So that's the wisdom of the crowds, right? If, even if one person doesn't think they know much, if you put together all their information, you might get a really good answer. Um, however, the, the value of an asset is different than the weight of a cow because the, the asset goes on and on and on. And so, you know, the crowd could think, I'm going to price this stock at 50 instead of 14 because next period is going to be at 55 or 60. And, and there, you know, the fact that other people may pay more money for something in the future can actually fuel the bubble. So it's, it's sort of the madness of crowds. So, so then how does your theory work into momentum investing, right? To bring in sort of a financial cliche, the former CEO of Citigroup, Chuck Prince, used to say, yes, we, we know a bubble is slow forming and it may not end well, but so long as the music is playing, get up and dance, right? Do you risk kind of leaving money on the table if uh, you, you keep on playing the trend? Yes, oh, absolutely. And another, a newer study we have, which is a little bit more kind of a follow-up and a, you know, a little bit better in some ways, we see um, a role for two different areas of the brain. And one is exactly, uh, we, we think of as connected to momentum investing. So the, the subjects who kind of ride the bubble and, and continue past the crash and actually do the worst, they hang on too long, 
you know, like the people in musical chairs that don't get to sit. They have activity in a region called the striatum or nucleus accumbens, which is a very old structure that encodes reward and economic surprise, you know, when good things happen or social rewards too. And so when they have more kind of irrational exuberance in this part of the brain, so to speak, they tend to ride the bubbles. So they, they look a lot like classic people chasing returns. Uh, they see prices go up, uh, they buy, and then that you know gives a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. So it sounds like your study scientifically proves Warren Buffett's theory that you should be greedy when others are fearful and perhaps fearful when others are greedy. Yes, yeah, so you, you, I hope you review our paper for the scientific journal because we actually use exactly that quote. And there's another part of the story that makes it even, even better which is that the smart money traders, they might be luck, they might be smart, we're not sure, because we only do it once per person. Uh, probably is a combination of both. Let's say they're smart money traders. They're people who build up share accumulations as the bubble's rising, and a few periods before the crash occurs, of course, nobody knows, including us, you know, when it will happen, but typically a few periods of trading before the crash, they start to get an early warning signal in a region called the insula, which is about here. It's like their, their brain knows it's going to happen. Meanwhile, the irrational exuberant traders, the momentum investors, actually have a dip in the insula as if they're totally comfortable. They've, they've, the brain is saying, this is going to last forever. There's nothing to fear here. Don't worry. Don't worry. And so um, the insula activity traders do get out in time, and they make twice as much money as the others. So that, that's the people who are being fearful, or in this case, sort of insula uncomfortable, uh, when the others are greedy. Uh, so Warren Buffett's thing really fits beautifully. It's not always the case in neuroscience that we get such a nice, clean result that fits the really conventional wisdom, or in Warren's case, maybe unconventional wisdom. Really quickly, Professor, can the Fed apply your research to forestalling or perhaps deflating bubbles? Uh, we, I think that someday we could use a variety of biological indicators, as well as things from, say, social media, which plays an important role, as Bob Schiller has emphasized. Um, it's a few years away, and we haven't tackled exactly that problem, but there's quite a few things that seem to go on in the minds of some investors and not other investors. Uh, including very simple things like how fast they buy and sell. You know, during the, when the bubble is heating up, they buy really fast. When there's a crash, they sell really fast. So I think somebody will be able to co construct a kind of early warning indicator s somewhere between you know forecasting a hurricane, which we can do very well these days, and forecasting a big earthquake, which we're still a little far away from. Well, that would be something. Professor Cameron, very interesting research. Thanks so much for coming on the program. It was my pleasure.